Sometimes it's here, then they can break. our final session on future FET Friday for FET Fest. It's been an absolute blast this week. So this afternoon we have a very, very special guest international speaker joining us. I would have the great pleasure of welcoming Eric Scheniger. Eric is an associate partner with the International Centre for Leadership in Education. Prior to this, he was the award-winning principal at New Milford High School. Under Eric's leadership, his school became a global recognised model for innovative practices. Eric oversaw the successful implementation of several sustainable change initiatives that radically transformed the learning culture at his school while increasing achievement. Eric's work focuses on leading and learning in the digital age as a model for moving schools and districts forward. This has led to the formation of the pillars of digital leadership a framework for all educators to initiate sustainable change to transform school cultures. Eric has received numerous awards and acknowledgements for his work. And I know I am so excited to get my hands on a copy of your new book, Eric, Disruptive Thinking. I'm waiting on it. I keep checking my post and, and it hasn't arrived yet. So Eric, you are so welcome to FatFest. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you for that very warm introduction. And good afternoon, everyone, but good morning from Houston, Texas, here in the United States. Uh, it is my honor to be with you all uh, this afternoon. So let me share my screen and we are going to get rocking and rolling. All right, let's share my content. Okay. So hopefully you all can see my screen now. We are ready to go. And again, my, my name is Eric Scheninger and it, it is my honor to be here with you this afternoon to talk about how we can see success in the new normal. Um, you know, a few little housekeeping items. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end, but feel free to reach out to me at any time. I am not a hard person to get a hold of in this world. So whether it's Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, Voxer, you name it, please don't hesitate to reach out. And, uh, you know, as we really get started here today, you know, I've been looking at the hashtag. It's been great to see you all share. Please feel free to continue to use that during uh, this session here this afternoon. Uh, if you want to connect with me on social media, uh, there's my Twitter handle, uh, at E underscore Scheninger, but by all means, you do not have to follow me. And if you do, and I tweet too much for you, just unfollow me. It's professional, not personal. So let me tell you quickly why I am here. I really shouldn't be. 
because I was the educator that did not believe in anything that my school eventually did or that I talk about now. I had a fixed mindset and really was in a silo. And two things happened that changed my trajectory. And when we think about change, we think about success in this new normal, we have to get be willing to get uncomfortable and acknowledge that we might not have all the answers and that's okay. So in 2009, uh, a student was running from me in my school because he broke our cell phone policy. And he was so afraid because they knew I would take his device that he actually physically ran. And I got on my walkie talkie at the time and I told my assistant principal, we got a runner. You go this way, I'll go that way. Oh, we, we, back then I was obviously a lot younger and I was a lot faster and we caught up and we said, give the device. And he did. And then he thanked me for creating a jail out of what should be a school. Listen, everybody, sometimes it's hard to understand, at least it was for me, that schools have to be designed for our kids. And the culture of the building that I was leading was not meeting their needs. Second thing that happened, I read a newspaper article about Twitter. And at the time I was living in New York City, and I thought, oh, I'm never getting on social media. This is a waste of my time. It's dumb. But I saw a connection to my practice, and that was communication. And I got on social media in 2009 to be a better communicator. And I just started sharing what was going on in my school. And at the time, there weren't many educators on social media. And then I got creepy. Hey, and don't take offense to this. Some of you might have been, might be creepy lurkers like I was. You're not creepy, but I lurked. And I learned how far behind my school was. I learned that I was not a leader for my students. I learned that I had to be better for my teachers. Why am I here today? Because those two points changed my whole trajectory as an educator. And from that point onward, we did everything that people told us that we could not do. We went bring your own device 12 years ago personalized blended learning 11 years ago. We created our own school within a school model. But I am here because the work of my teachers, we improved achievement. We became one of my state's top performing schools for achievement. And the state that I worked in was number one here in the United States. We never got that honor. And we're gonna talk about, you know, how do we learn those lessons from the past and really begin to implement them now? I told you my quick story of change because every single one of you, regardless of your position, you are in an environment that is extremely disruptive. And the world was disruptive before the pandemic. So as we look at all, this is what happens in just 60 seconds. 168 million emails are sent. Oh my goodness. 600 plus new YouTube videos. A lot of change, a lot of communication, and a lot of disruption. And it's not just what's happening here with social media. You know, we right now are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, some of you were students in the fourth industrial revolution. Many of us were students during the third industrial revolution. But what do we have in common with our learners today? Many of us were still taught with first industrial revolution methodologies, a one size fits all approach, a mass model. As we think about where we are, I want you to dream and aspire to where you can be. And it begins with taking that critical lens to our practice, everyone. And as we look at, you know, school, how does school prepare kids for a world that we cannot predict. And as we think about that, none of us, I'll tell you right now, here in America, we were not prepared for COVID-19. We had, we were, we had not have the professional learning in place. We weren't using learning management systems effectively. Heck, we weren't even using technology effectively. And I can say that because I visited, I basically spent time at thousands of classrooms every year. No one was prepared and that's okay. But you want to know what we all have in common? Whether we are here in America or you all in Ireland, you all 
were building the plane and flying it at the same time. You figured it out. You and your respective positions were able, able to overcome the most challenging event in education that anyone has ever experienced. And what happened was change that might not have been a reality before the pandemic has now become commonplace. Look at us right now. I don't know about you, but I did not do any virtual presentations before the pandemic. And now, even though I can't see you, we are able to communicate even asynchronously. You can go on Twitter. Think about how we've just, you know, we've made the world a smaller place. But, you know, we were able, you all were able to put away, put aside the excuses and focus not on the yeah buts, but the what ifs. And when we think about the what ifs and we think about our practice, before the pandemic, it was a great time to disrupt the status quo, to change. But I will tell you right now, with all the lessons learned, you all, us globally, were part of a clean slate moment. COVID-19 allowed us to just wipe the slate clean, reimagine, transform, reinvent whatever word you want to use. But we don't want to lose that momentum, everyone. The time is now. There's no better time to continue to transform education, to create a new normal. But it begins with every single one of you. And we have to be willing to shift our mindset and look at things a little differently. I used to be a cat. Every day the same. I'd be aloof to lunch then coldly indifferent after. To me, everything was just meh. Then it hit me. Why be so cat? Why not be a bit more dog? I mean, look at the world today. It's amazing. Running, amazing. Chasing cars, amazing. Sticks, amazing. Carpe diem. It means grab the frisbee. Maybe we should all be a bit more dog. Be more dog. You know what's amazing, everyone? You all have been more dog, but your work has been downright amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for sticking with the field of education. Thank you for being there for each other. But thank you all in your respective positions for being there for your learners in Ireland. And when we think about change, everyone, you know, we think about the why. I think it's pretty clear why we need to continually change. But when we think about the main factor or motivator, it's those who we serve. And we serve learners. Every single kid has greatness hidden inside them. It's the job of an educator to help them find and unleash that greatness. And that really is our driving force in education, regardless of the country we reside in. So how do we go about doing that? How do we see success in the new normal where it's not about more work? It's not about working harder. It's about working smarter. It's about doing what we already do better. It's about having a laser-like focus. The key to success, to success now and in the future really resides on two things. How we empower all kids to think the vertical axis. But also, just as important, how do you get your learners in your classroom, your school, your respective cultures to apply their learning in relevant and meaningful ways, the horizontal axis. When people ask me, Eric, how did your teachers change when parents spoke 40 different languages, when one third of your population was classified special needs, when your building was built in 1928, when you had no money, our sort of success was we needed a common vision, common language, common expectations to get everyone on the same page. 
And that's when we use this rigor relevance framework. It didn't matter the standards we had. It didn't matter the curriculum that we had. It gave us sort of a lens to look at everything we did. And that lens only really consisted of two things. And it really began with relevance. And now, hey, I get this. You know, you want learning to be relevant. You're all here now with me. You don't want to be bored. You want to know, hey, after today, what am I going to be able to take away from Eric's talk that's going to help me be a better educator? Because we know that a lack of relevance can be draining. A lack of relevance can be draining for our kids as well. We don't want this to happen in our schools. <laughs> Hey, relevance is important to us and it's important to our kids. And it doesn't matter your role. We all want meaning. And when we think about if a lesson is relevant, your kids will be able to tell you, their parents, their grandparents, their guardians, not just what they learned, but why did they learn it? And how will they use what they learned in the real world? Relevance is about meaning, and that really is the gateway. You know, first we want to form a culture of relationships, but then we want to make sure that meaning, that relevance is there. Then we want to challenge our learners. You know, I always tell people, nothing I say is new. I'll tell you right now, nothing anyone says really is new. Good teaching is good teaching. Learning is learning. Leadership is leadership. Those three things have not changed. The environment in which we teach, learn, and lead has changed. Now, when we look at challenging our learners, we think about rigor. Rigor is how we challenge kids to think. Bloom's taxonomy, Webb's depth of knowledge, levels of thinking, doesn't matter what you call it. The key is to always think about how we can scaffold questions, scaffold tasks, and it really comes down to not just the questions that we ask, but how do we create classroom and learning cultures where kids are asking questions? Because when they're asking questions, that means learning is relevant. That means they are being challenged. So as you think about simple steps that you can do, whether you are in a classroom as a teacher or you are supporting teachers in some form, is always think about the questions that are asked and the tasks that our kids are engaged in. Is there rigor? Is there relevance? And the role of technology should be a way to enhance and support. As we think about success, as we think about seizing success, in the new normal, we wanna make sure that it's not about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. If something's working, great. But I always want, I always challenge schools here in America to say, why do you do things the way you do them? How might you do them differently and better? And what will tell you if you're successful? When we look at technology, this was created by a grade six teacher. And this teacher reminds us technology is a tool. It's not a learning outcome. The tool is gonna do what it's designed to do. Technology is not a silver bullet. It's not gonna cure all the challenges that we all face, but it can really be a powerful way to help kids learn. Two questions for you. How are your learners in Ireland? using technology to learn in ways that they couldn't without it. Number two, how are you as educators using technology to do what you already do better? And as we think about the role of technology, the possibilities are endless, everyone. These are some images from students here in schools that I work with in America. And I have these images because they really show that the student should be in the driver's seat, the teacher as a facilitator. On the left, those are grade one students that are drawing their responses as a form of closure to end of lesson. In the middle, 
that is a kindergarten student who's using sight words where the prompt was use your sight words and design a classroom where you learn best using voiceovers and submitting them all to a top app called Seesaw. On the right, that is a grade six student who's processing a word problem before he will go and answer it in Kahoot. Rigor, relevance, as we look at how we progress on the left, those are students that are going through self-paced Google tra uh, translations in Google Slides. In the middle, those are grade five students that are answering math questions using a tool called GimKit. On the right, that's a grade seven classroom where the teacher integrated real-time exit tickets, where the kids could actually respond. And if a few kids got it wrong, the teacher addressed it outside the classroom to really maximize that in-class experience. When we look at the purposeful integration of technology, on the left, that is a grade nine student who is reading independently in class while the learners that are remote are also doing their annotations at the same time. Top right, that's what a grade 10 classroom looks like in one of the schools that I support. You can see the Bitmoji classroom, the learning target, the Google slide activity, the exit ticket. On the bottom, that's a grade eight teacher who took the whole breakout room concept to a whole new level where she made slight changes. And after her lesson, kids got to pick the optimal learning environment for them. All of these examples show the power of educators to innovate with purpose, to use technology in a way that supports and enhances those outcomes that we want every single kid. You know, so my advice to you as you are either working in a classroom or supporting classrooms is to think about how does the use of technology represent that fundamental improvement? And when we go back to the rigor relevance framework, are students using tech to recall, remember, explain ideas or concepts, use information in a new way? You can read all those questions, but are they actually applying their learning in ways that are relevant? across disciplines to solve real world situations, real world unpredictable. Because when we think about disruptive thinking, it's how do we get kids to create their own intuitive ideas to solve those problems, think critically in this very disruptive world. And as Michael Fullen says, pedagogy the driver, technology the accelerator. Work inside out, everyone. We all know that the common goal is we want to, our learners to do well. So we gotta get them to think. You see knowledge taxonomy in the middle, the verbs, the actions, the last thing, the last thing we should focus on is the tool. But as we think about not just what- it's Oh, I got ahead of myself. This is what happens when I get excited. It's not just, what happens in our classrooms, everyone. It's how do you all collectively create an experience for your kids? Because it's that experience. Hey, you've all been part of an experience this week, this online experience to help you grow and get better. And that's the goal. And we have to understand that every single experience shapes our learning. Now I wanna show you an experience that happened four years ago that is pretty commonplace now in our COVID-19 world. And it really, and whole, I'll tell you right now, I've had an experience like this, and this is what shapes our learning. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's no, I would argue that this is a triumph of democracy. Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift is shifting. Shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> what is this going to mean for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South. I crack up every time I watch that video because that experience 
told this person that he needs to lock the door and go somewhere where he will not be interrupted. Now, I'm in my garage right now, but I had my same experience. I thought I locked the door and actually I left it open and I'm doing a presentation like this. In comes dog number one, in comes dog number two. Then my mother-in-law came running in because she lives in an apartment in our house. It was chaos. It was chaos. We learn from experience. And that's the key as we think about our learners, whether it's Ireland or America, we want to create not an equal experience, but an equitable experience for our learners. All kids doing the same thing the same way at the same time is not equity. Equity is all kids getting what they need when and where they need it. What does that look like? Yes, you can use technology, but you don't have to. You're not getting rid of instruction and lectures. You're just making sure it's timely. But when you think about personalization, personalization is a move from what, what we teach, what's in the curriculum, what's on the test, and the shift is from what to who, our learners to emphasize ownership of learning. It's about how that learning environment, the number one factor to make a learning environment personal is the educator in the classroom. The second are the educators that support what happens in the classroom. It's how you make instruction personal. It's the pedagogy, the strategies you use to empower kids to learn in meaningful ways. It's how you take your curriculum and make it meaningful, relevant, contextual. It's how you use data to group, regroup kids, to provide targeted instruction, to differentiate. And the elements which we call high agency, we look at voice, how we get all of our learners involved. That's where technology is a game changer, especially in a remote world where we can use tools where every kid can respond. And I showed you some examples already in those images where all kids were able to draw their response or submit a response. Choice, choosing the right tool for the right task, choosing where to learn, choosing their own path. If we put all kids on the same path, everyone, if I put all of you and make you do the same thing the same way, some of you will be aggravated because you learn differently. We have to understand that we have to set up different paths. That's what differentiation is all about. If learning is the goal within reason, allowing kids to work at their own pace, but also place. Before we went live, we all were talking about how here in where my kids go to school, we're creating a virtual school going forward where our kids can choose to be virtual. So as we look, what does this all look like? How can this translate to your practice in your classrooms. The key to personalization is blended learning. Now, there's a difference between blended learning and blended instruction. Blended instruction is what the teacher does with tech. Having all kids use a Kahoot, a quizzes, a gim kit, okay? That's okay, but the teacher's directing that. Blended learning is where your kids use technology to control some aspect of path, pace, or place. So what can this look like? These are some schools across the United States that I work with, all different grade levels. This is the station rotation model, and this moves away from all kids doing the same thing at the same time the same way. The teacher will do his or her mini lesson first. There will be direct instruction, there will be whole group, but after 10 or 15 minutes, they move to a model that really engages kids through different modalities, different tasks. On the top left, all those kids are grouped by data, data that the teachers are collecting. And you can see that every couple minutes, they will then shift to a new station. On the right, that is another example that was first, first was second grade, this one's first grade kids working on different tasks in the middle. That's what grade 11 station rotation could look like. 
don't think that is just an elementary task. Now, it's not just station rotation. Another popular model is choice boards. And this was created for our youngest learners in kindergarten. And but I want you to just put, pick some, you know, look at some key elements here. Kids get to choose, they don't do all the tasks, choose one from each color. But then they have to upload evidence into an app called Seesaw. And that's the key. The rigor and the relevance should be embedded in all of these tasks. You know, I mentioned in the personalization image about using data. On the left, that's one of the best examples of differentiation I have ever seen. I saw that in March, and when I walked in, I saw the four different groupings. Each group has a must do and a may do tasks. Each group was grouped using here dibbles and iReady data. And the teacher was observed working with one student who needed the most help. Personalization is about freeing up your time as educators to work with the kids that need you the most. On the right, that's another example of differentiation. So as we, and then going into a choice, but here's how it translates it to the upper grade levels. This is high school biology. This is what it looks like for a student in one of my districts where I've been working there for two years. Even today, this is in uh, the learning management system. In their case, they're using Canvas. And even right to this day, kids have access to this anytime. And when you drill down into the tasks, here's what it looks like. Kids have everything. They can work at their own pace. All these blue links are hyperlinked. The teacher creates inspirational contextual videos to get kids excited. If a kid goes on quarantine, if a student is sick, they have the same equitable access as those learners in school. But if you look closely on Thursday, you will see molecules of life choice board assignment. When I walked into this classroom this past August, I asked the learner, can you show me what you're working on? And this is what the learner showed me. You look at these tasks, rigorous, relevant, but the best part for me was my conversation with the teacher. And this teacher said to me, Eric, I could never go back to the way I used to teach. I have been a full-time consultant for over seven years, and I have seen the most scalable change happen in a short period of time these past nine months. I cannot commend you all for what you have accomplished. Speaking of accomplishments, this is a playlist. This was my daughter's grade five teacher here. And the difference between a playlist and a choice board, the kids do all the activities, they get to choose the order. At the bottom, there's an adaptive learning tool. The kids, when they're done, they go onto a Google sheet and they mark in that they completed it. The teacher pulls kids based on data who needs the most help. At the end of all of these examples I just showed you, there's a scaffolded formative assessment. And by the way, what you're looking at are all examples of teachers, educators, and schools that took feedback that I provided them to think about how they could use time better. And that's my call to action for all of you. I want you to think about everything that you do awesome, but I also want you to think about where there's areas to grow and improve. Maybe it's integrating choice, voice, path, pace, place, but that decision is yours and yours alone, everyone. I am not here to tell you what to do. I would never do that. My job is to get you to think about what you do and how you might be able to do it better. And I'm not saying you have to use all these strategies all the time. No, use them when they're appropriate. But as you look at the culture of your schools, your organizations in Ireland, where is their opportunity to seize the moment and create a business as unusual model that becomes the status quo? On the left, that's the way we've always done it. 
which I'm not saying it's bad, but it doesn't create an equitable experience for our kids. Do blue, just don't reside there, everybody. And again, you know how much you've accomplished. Continue to look how you can move the needle forward. And as you think about moving that needle forward, it's also contingent upon that we continue to learn. You all are learning here today. You've learned all week. Every day, lessons are learned. Let me show you a lesson that this person learned. Lesson learned, don't celebrate too soon. You know another lesson about professional learning is it's a balancing act. Yes, it's what the school, the organization needs, but it's also what you need at a personal level. It's not just personalized learning for kids, everybody. Every single one of you, regardless of your position, effective professional learning is that balance between what the school, what the organization, what Ireland needs or wants from you, but also what you need. And as we think about professional learning, it doesn't stop today, everybody. You can learn anytime, anywhere with anyone you want. Why did I tell you my opening story about how I changed and got on Twitter? Because that was me on the top. I was a disconnected nomad. I didn't know what I didn't know. I thought I had all the answers. I thought we were doing an okay job. And when I became a connected learner and created my own personal learning network, look at how my learning became, I became the center of my learning. Two-way arrows, two-way flows. This is why I told you to please don't hesitate to engage with me and others on Twitter because we have the same goal. Doesn't matter where we live. Our goal is helping our learners be successful. Ultimately, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Learn anytime, anywhere with anyone you want. Ideas, resources, strategies, all this is right there for you. But as we shift from improving the work and we see success in this new normal, I really want you to tell your story. Oh, sorry. I got a little excited again. When you think about telling your story, it's about effective communication. And now I'm going to show you what effective communication looks and feels like. I tell you, I'm pregnant. Uh, what, what were you thinking? Why you have to um, just, just get another baby? You just have two. So why do you? Amaya. Because because you just got two. So you don't, why do you want to place why do you want to get another baby and just replace one of your babies if there's too much? Oh, baby, we will never replace you and Amaya. You just gonna have another brother or sister that you have to take care of. Well help take care of. But that doesn't make no sense. <laughs> Hey, think about it. Think about the body language. Think about the points that he made that were pretty valid. Communication is how you all build relationships with your students, with each other. It's about how you show value in everything that you do in your country. It's about how you reach your stakeholders, parents, guardians, businesses, government officials. It's how you showcase success and build loyalty. Effective communication in this new normal is about meeting your stakeholders where they are and engaging them in two-way communication, connecting with them and building relationships. And you know, when we think about sharing what we do, don't look at it as bragging. You've earned the right, in my opinion, to brag about what you do. But here's a fact, everyone. In the animal kingdom, the rules eat or be eaten. 
In the human kingdom, it's define or be defined. If you're not sharing all the awesome work that you do, it just takes one crazy person with a smartphone and a Facebook account to take away all the incredible things that you do every single day for kids. I want you to become the storyteller in chief. I want you to be proud. I guarantee if you showed me what you're doing, if I stepped foot in your schools, there would be things that I'd be like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. And then I'd ask, why are you not sharing it? Why are you not blogging? Why is it not on Instagram? Why is it not on Twitter? I'm telling you right now, the world has changed. Yes, we want to be humble, but sharing the work of how you're impacting kids is not bragging. That is celebrating. If you're sharing all the great stuff, you will drown out any mention of the bad. And that's the only way to counteract negativity. How do you do it? You have so many tools. The best tool you have is your phone and pictures. I showed you pictures of actual work from teachers in schools because I feel that's the most powerful way to get a message across. The brain processes images faster than text a lot faster showcase through images and as you saw my pictures you didn't see any defining characteristics of kids you didn't see any names i protected their identity i also showed you a lot of short videos yes because they're funny and that's my way to get humor and soon coming up emotion across a one minute video is equal to 1.8 million written words it could be text video, links, whatever. But as you think about where you are, don't wait for the right opportunity. Create it. Be proud of all that you've accomplished, but never become complacent. Understand that there's no perfection in education. There is no perfect teacher, leader, school, organization or country in education we always have the opportunity to get better everyone and i want you to seize that opportunity every single day and as you think about your importance please 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 never say that oh i'm just a teacher i'm just an educator my work doesn't matter no one cares about what i do I'm telling you right now, everyone, you are sorely mistaken if that is your outlook. Never underestimate the impact you have on others. Be a merchant of hope. Now, I'm going to show you one last video. And I want you to not view the role of this very famous basketball player here in the United States. But I want you to look through your role. Because this video is about all that you do to make a difference in the lives of kids. since I last seen you. I come from an area where not too many people make it. It was always my dream that I'd get the chance to go to college, but we just didn't have the money. You mean so much to us. And my brother, Joaquin, loved you from the beginning. He passed away in Parkland on February 14th. He was one of the 17 victims. 10 days before Christmas, our house burned down and we lost everything. It was one of the lowest points of my life. Hey, Dwight. 
fight on my you were the joy of my life but i was dropping the ball that day that i just couldn't do it no more was the day that i was going to have to turn myself in and i seen the tears just fall from your eyes your mama went down a road Dwayne, that i didn't ever think i'd come back from But on that road, I noticed you kept showing up and you'll come and see about me. And Dwayne, because you believe in me, when I got out of prison, I was a different woman. We received a phone call. Would you mind if Dwayne Wade take you and the family <laughs> on a shopping spree? It just meant the world to me that you were there for us at this time. Thank you. you became our hero. A lot of the words that you said hit a spark and kind of changed where I was gone. Without you and your full tuition scholarship, none of this would have been possible. You're not way the basketball player, the legend. You're the human being that took the time and on his own, wrote my brother's name on his shoe, and you care. When you bought your mama that church, you don't even understand the lives that you changed. So what don't have a jersey, but I brought you this. I don't have a jersey to trade with you, but I definitely have this, the blazer that I wore to my first job interview. My cap and gown from graduation. This is important because Joaquin wore this in his last championship. My family wanted you to have it. Please don't forget my brother, Joaquin. Having you as a role model has made all the difference. One of the special robes that you gave me Purple symbolized royalty, and you are royal in everybody's life that you've been touched. You completely changed the course of my life. I know my brother is with you always. It wouldn't have been possible to be here if it wasn't you. I am more proud of the man you have become than the basketball player. You are bigger than basketball. I hope you understand that I showed that video to remind you all that you change lives. You have believed in your kids. You've believed in each other. You've believed in education in Ireland. And he, honestly, you need to give yourself a pat on the back. High fives, fist bumps, whatever you want to do. But you were in the place of that famous basketball player. Never, ever, ever underestimate or discredit all the noble and amazing work that you do. But do remember, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. The two most powerful statements anyone can make, I don't know, and I need help. There is no shame in that, everyone. Everything that you do, everything that we do to serve kids comes down to relationships. Without trust, there's no relationship. Without relationships, no real learning occurs. Again, it's been an honor for me to have a few moments to connect with all of you. And, you know, when we think about everything that you've accomplished, you know, as a parent, as someone on the outside now, I am just in awe of your resilience, your dedication, your determination, your commitment, your selflessness, the empathy that you've shown during this difficult time. And now you have the opportunity to use those lessons to build on your successes to seize greater success in this new normal. Don't think you have to do it all yourself. Make sure you prioritize your time, the standards that you're gonna address, the social emotional learning needs of your kids. Continue to advance learning and equity in your classrooms and know and appreciate the impact that you have. So, oh yeah, I'm only four minutes over from what I thought, but I had permission to go over a little bit. Uh, I will uh, open it up for some questions. Just know I only have about seven minutes because I have to get on with another school system here uh, on the hour. 
Um, I, I went a, a little, a little bit into the concepts in the book. Um, there's the link, and I have Google Docs to hundreds of examples to validate the points that I talk about in the book. And tomorrow, the digital version drops. Um, because one thing I've heard is all the sh sh shipping issues across the world, but the digital version comes out tomorrow. So, um, but again, thank you so much. And uh, actually I'll turn over to you to see if there's any questions during the short time that we've left. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much, Eric. Eric, you have given you have us given so much, so much towards, towards you know, preparing, preparing for our, our new normal, what, whatever that's, that's going to be. Um, and, I know I'm really looking forward to watching this piece back again and um, because my head was just I had so many thoughts, so many ideas and, and so many different directions towards, I suppose, how to regroup over the summer in preparing for next year. So the question here um, I'm going to put to you, how do you see career guidance counselling or career guidance as part of our new normal? Yeah, I mean, that's so important because, as we all know, the careers that might be here now for our youngest learners are not going to be what is there when they graduate. And, and I think when we look at relevance, that connection to potential, potential careers, and I say potential, not to discredit, we are still going to need plumbers, electricians, carpenters, auto mechanics, farmers, and when we look at their learning, that those professions are all about disruptive thinking. But I think it has to be woven into the fabric. But in addition to career, let's think about the competencies that our kids need to have. Critical thinking, problem solving, not new. Creativity, not new. Greater emphasis, remote collaboration, because more, we're not getting rid of video conferencing, breakout rooms, all that, because more and more businesses are going remote. Self-regulation, emotional intelligence, time management. So I think the career counseling piece, the focus on those competencies is so important. Great question. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm really conscious of, of time, but I want to sneak in one qu quick sneaky one on behalf of our colleagues, our PD coordinators, have you one piece of advice for transforming or reimagining professional development? Yeah, oh, I had a lot of uh, pieces of advice. You know, one thing is let's really focus on what the research tells us. Um, you look at research most notably, notably from Linda Darling Hammond at a Stanford University and a lot of others is, you know, job embedded ongoing. You know, so as you think about professional learning, job embedded, ongoing, but also focusing on choice. Everything you all just saw from a classroom perspective is what I'm modeling when I'm working with schools and organizations. I have them going through station rotation, choice boards, playlists. So I think we have to model those experiences that we wish to see. So in addition to job embedded, ongoing, modeling it and making sure that we are at the forefront of the practices that we want to see in our classrooms. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you so much for taking the time out to join us here in Ireland. And we really do hope that the next time it's in real life. Yeah, me too. Me too. I was, you know, I'd love to be out there in your beautiful country. But hey, you know what? I get to present in my garage and uh, walk my dogs now so they win. But again, everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. And uh, remember, you had all my contact information. Don't be shy. And if I can't help you, because I don't have all the answers, no one does, I'll point you in the right direction. Have a great weekend, everyone, and enjoy your much-deserved summer. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Eric. So thank you to everyone who's still here with us. So next up, we have the absolute pleasure of invite, inviting Moira Walsh, currently the Director of People in Solis. Moira has worked there for the past four years. She spent over 20 years in a variety of edu 
educational roles in both public and private sector in Ireland and in Canada, advocating the importance of learning, development, engagement and culture, and Moira lives by the work philosophy of nothing about us without us. Moyer's portfolio in Solace has recently changed to include professional development in the FET sector, and it is a pleasure to pop into Moira in, in having the chat in Kumo space during the week. It was fantastic to, to have you join us, Moira. And also, I know that you've, you've made it to as many sessions this week as, as you possibly can, and it was great to continue that conversation on Twitter. So we are delighted to welcome you, Moira, to join us live to bring FET Fest to a close. I'm absolutely honoured and blown away and it was all a gift to me. Uh, rearranging my calendar was uh, was probably one of the best things that I've done this week. Um, and I suppose <laughs> just after coming off Eric's conversation, that was so relevant and that was some experience and that really put meaning and purpose to FedFest for me. And, uh, and I'm really glad, as you said earlier on, that this is going on YouTube um, because I, I need to watch that back. That was really powerful, as was all of the, the different talks that went on this week. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to thank Trevor Boland because of his PowerPoint talk. I'm now using PowerPoint for my talking notes, so hats off and thank you very much to Trevor Boland just to, to kick off. That was really, really um, a beautiful piece of information I learned along with you can create GIFs in PowerPoint. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Moira Walsh and I'm the Director of People in Solace. And when I was asked to close out um, this FET Fest, I was, I was absolutely delighted. Um, as part of my portfolio, as you've just said, Ashley, um, I'll now be involved in professional learning and development space in, in FET. And having spoken to and met so many people involved in professional learning and development over the past weeks, I'm even more honoured that I was asked. Um, I've attended I've attended many conferences in the past, and I'm sure everyone here has too. And I've seen a lot of closing speeches, um, many of which with, left me with takeaways and opportunities to think differently. No pressure <laughs> in the last few minutes. Um, and so obviously it was really important to me now that I would make time to attend this session. And I began to look in detail at the sessions. I've never been close to being asked to close a session before, um, but I knew from the quality of speakers that there would be valuable takeaways and it would be easy to find those takeaways. Um, the most important element for me was to follow and engage um, with this community and obviously to learn. But as I as I as I began to learn and I and I began to watch and uh, um, even from the first moments, um I, I was immersing I was immersing myself into different live events. I, I went to Kumo Space, coolest thing ever, um, fell into a conversation um, and thought this is amazing stuff. Uh, the sidebar conversations that were going on, the moderated chat all the way through the sessions, the Twitter activity. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening, but I was completely drawn into a community that had created this opportunity. And, and I suppose as a closing point, this was really important to me to actually talk about this community. Um, at a conference years ago, I was told a story about um, a what's called yellow car syndrome, or now I know it's called badder Meinhof phenomenon. Um, the audience were asked when they were when they'd last seen a, a yellow car, and and a few people put up their hands. Um, we were asked kind of to leave the conference and notice yellow cars after we left and the next day the topic of conversation at the very start of the day was the increased number of yellow cars that were driving around the city where the conference was at was at the idea is when you notice something new it's all you see and you put all your attention to it and the moment that i started to see this community of people who were giving of their time their expertise their energy and focus on learning and and the learning for the sake of others i just couldn't stop seeing it um you know this group of people who've created this space and learning in the middle of a pandemic in the greatest crisis that has happened in our lifetime and where so so often and so many judgments were being thrown that learning couldn't adapt and it was evident and has been evident this week the amount of adaptability a community of teachers and educators that are being bombarded with negative social media and press accusations for asking for support in their work in the front line and I think when Caroline Martin 
uh, it was a kind of a game changer for me because I suppose I'd never heard of collective effic efficacy, I can't even pronounce properly, but this whole idea of this whole being greater than the sum of the parts, um, George Corus said it again yesterday that the cha to change um, the learning experience in the classroom, we have to change the professional development experience and all learning is is personable. And, and I think staying staying close to the learning and trusting everything that we've shared um, amongst this group, um, it's evidence that ego isn't actually a word in this festival of learning. Uh, it's it's just been this this huge game changer changer for me. So I suppose it's easy for me to come and say, look, um, here, here's all the change. Here's here's what I'm seeing. But uh, it's the power of the people. Car Carl Neenan and, and Carrie Archer showed me the power of storytelling. And, and my mind immediately went to one of my favourite teachers, which is uh, Seth Godin. So when you're up close, face to face with people, it's difficult to dismiss the humanity of others. Um, both spoke such a, at a human level and and I was immediately inspired to look inward and and I suppose again from sets one human at a time because it might feel like a slog to you but it matters to them and and I'm just so grateful for all the learning that went on um this week Liz Wiseman um refers to leaders being multipliers or diminishers those that that make you feel like you have all of the ability uh, in the world to grow and multiply or those who slowly and generally unknowingly dampen your enthusiasm and diminish your your ability to lead I've seen the power of multipliers and, and leaders this week um, to hear Minister Harris call out the need for an integrated third level system available to everyone and to hear um, Eric talking about equity. It gives energy and light to this actually happening in Ireland and I've no doubt with the people that I have seen and, and heard this week there, there will only be change for good. Um, and I believe that Wellbeing Wednesday is now a thing. Uh, and so if you've heard the talk on the nature uh, from the travel experts, then everyone's doing a staycation. I booked a trip to Ackle Island. And if Rama is available for gigs or any musical opportunity, I'm in on that one. Um, so I suppose when I spoke about takeaways earlier, um, takeaways are something that you can choose to take away uh, and, uh, and again Eric spoke about choice there sh over the last um, 40 minutes uh, in different ways. I think for me there has to be a call to action for 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 me as, as somebody who was involved and watched uh, as, as an outsider watching what was going on uh, the call of action to me and probably the wake-up call for me personally because foolishly and arrogantly I thought that the future of learning in FET would start on the outside. And how wrong was I when I saw the fire that is already lighting from within? Um, I'm really grateful for all the sessions and to be part of, of, of all of this, of this work that has gone on. And actually what I've chosen to do rather than takeaways, I, I'm, I'm giving you some of the actions I'm doing as part of the HR forum with Solace. We do a HR forum in Solace. We'll be watching some of these sessions over the coming months and discussing, discussing how this learning um, will impact Solace thinking. And, and I'm starting with the one on the tell tips from Karen Burke and Stephen Eustace. Um, Thanks to Katie Novak, I'm removing any barriers in my thinking to support this space um, and I'll communicate in many ways with this group in FET learning and then I'll get out of your brilliant way. Um, this week the FET Fest has really shown me why the future of FET is so bright. Eric just said it there, shout loud and proud. This event, otherwise now known as Electric Picnic 2.0, is a space and community of people who are now invested um, in not not in, not in just how people learn or where people learn at its very base level. It's about being at your best self and modeling the way. And you've just modeled and shown uh, so many um, in this whole festival of learning what can be done. And I'm really excited to see this in, in the future face to face. This is next year's I'm, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, it will be a live event. It'll be another five day event and I'm there. <laughs> I'm there already. Give me a ticket. Um, Kathy Kerr, it was Karnowski and, and Becky Keane encouraged us all to be change makers. Um, we have it in us to be, to inspire um, and to be profound change makers of the future and showing others um, that not just only will we say what's needed, but we'll do it and call ourselves out when we don't deliver. I'm taking this valuable lesson and I'm going to apply it to any future learning that we offer in Solace and, and to live up to it myself. 
I'm going to dump <laughs> two of the most dangerous words in the English language out of my head. Uh, and they are I know and make sure I create real opportunities to ask questions and listen with both ears. Um, it was great to hear Eric just say that one of the most valuable uh, statements is I don't know. So um, I'm choosing to dump the I know um, statements out of my head. Um, I'm going to hold my nerve and trust the process um, and whoever mentioned the good enough analogy. Thank you. The ripples of change have already started. Um, and I'll be using Laura Hilliard's Brady's I am to ensure that I'm conscious and in the present. Um, I think the power of us uh, and the, 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 that that statement it was so evident this week and and looking at what is available and already developed in the space. There's only exciting times ahead. I think the power of one should also be called out too. And there were so many powers of one, one person making a difference. Since it was announced that I was closing this festival of learning, I've received many emails asking me to thank people individually. Um, to those who who made who brought this 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 uh, this whole session or this whole learning week alive. No surprise that those who are most instrumental were the ones who were asking me to thank everyone else. And so again, it just shows the kind of community of people that exist here. Um, even that small act of kindness shows so much and says so much um, to everyone who shared their knowledge so kindly on behalf of all of us who learned this week. Um, thank you. Um, I was asked by many to thank Carrie Archer in the city of Dublin ETB for all that she's contributed and the difference she makes to everyone who encounters her. Thank you, Carrie. Um, to Jessica and the Kumo Space people, um, I only made it in there twice. Um, the opportunity to discuss sessions over copious amounts of virtual drinks um, was um, just amazing. Thank you. Um, to Kildare Wicklow ETB, to Dr. Taylor Keyes, the uh, Chief Executive, to Ken Seary, the Fed Director, um, to Wendy for being the backbone of all things Fed Fest, um, all the way over to those handling all of the technology so that we could have this beautiful opportunity opportunity to learn. Thank you. Um, and finally, to Ashley Stevens, um, who in our most humble of ways held the course, had the idea, um, made it happen, found the tribe and watched it fly. Um, you remind me of Ed Harris in the movie uh, Apollo 13, and it was funny because um, obviously Eric is in Houston, Texas, and and obviously it was shot in in uh, in Houston. Um, you only want to come to the forefront um, if you have to take responsibility for something that's not working. Um, you don't want any of the limelight, um, but from all of the PD coordinators and from all the teachers and educators who have been involved in this week and who have learned. Um, thank you. Um, and if this is what the future of FET looks like, I'm all in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moira. I I have no words left this this week. I think I think we're all out. So I'm going to rob one of the my most valuable takeaways from from the week. And that is again from Caroline Martin. And it's the power of us coming together as a collective. This would not have been possible without our collective. Thank you. So next up, and we're finishing on this one. This is rolling us out to close. <laughs> we have our closing segment from Leash Offaly ETB, and it's Tullamore FET, a FET Centre of the Future by Michelle Shannon. Hello, my name is Michelle Shanahan and I'm the manager of Tullamore Further Education and Training Centre. Tullamore FET is one of 13 FET centres across Leash and Offaly ETB. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the integrated approach we use here in Tullamore FET in allowing access, pathways and progression for all. We are committed to delivering a high quality learning environment which meets the needs of all learners from varying different backgrounds, ages and abilities. We offer a range of services, including adult guidance, adult literacy, learning support, full-time and part-time courses, and a vast array of certified evening classes and hobby classes. We provide courses from QQI Level 1 right up to Level 6, including PLC, 
BTI, Adult Literacy, Community Education, BTOS, Skills to Advance and Traineeship all under one roof. A key element of our integrated centre is we have something for everyone, regardless of their previous education level. We offer each learner a progression pathway to take them as far as they wish to go. For some, the learner journey can be fast paced or it can be scenic with winding roads along the way. The learner journey may require pit stops and we are there to support them with mentoring, learning support, literacy provision and guidance. This supports personal growth, academic achievement, as well as building skills capacity for future progression. Integrating these services enables learners who are attending different programmes to become aware of the progression routes available to them. Students can progress easily between programmes. For example, a cookery course in community education to a level two food and choice course under literacy, to level three culinary operations under BTI, to level four catering under VTOS, to level five hospitality in PLC. The familiarity of the centre makes this a less daunting prospect for students who might otherwise not consider these options. Having integrated services in one location also makes it much easier for staff to refer students to the relevant services so that students can quickly get the support that they need. In recent years, we have moved away from using descriptors such as VTOS courses or BTI courses when advertising to the general public. We noticed that students weren't aware if it was a VTOS or a BTI funded programme. They never categorised themselves as completing a VTOS course or a BTI course. For them, it was simply, I'm doing a full-time childcare course or I'm doing an engineering course. We therefore decided to simplify the application process for students by advertising all our courses as either full-time or part-time, as you can see here on our website. When students have successfully been offered a place, we meet with them through the guidance service and there we can decide if they're eligible for VTOS, Back to Education Allowance or SUSE. The learner therefore becomes a Tullamore FET student and not a VTOS or a BTI student. Our vision of integration is that it is seamless, it is FET for everyone. From the initial application, the learner is now connected to Tullamore FET as a learner. They are nurtured and empowered. We acknowledge their contribution with our student council, which gives advice to part-time and full-time students. We see this as pivotal in supporting green education in the future, as well as a forum to open dialogue for learners to ensure our provision is FET for everyone. The integration of services supports the journey, addresses the barriers to promote inclusion and keeps the learner journey as the focal point, whether that is employment, higher education, upskilling or simply ste stepping onto the educational ladder for the first time. Learning support is a recent addition in our centre. While there were supports for PLC through the HEA Disability Fund gra grant, a gap existed for those part-time. We now have a learning support officer who offers additional support to learners with their academic studies. Learners can avail of this on a one-to-one -one basis or in small groups throughout the academic year. Math support is also provided along with a mentoring service. Tullamore teaching staff adopt a universal design approach in their teaching which underpins learning development and delivery. Our programmes use BKSB as an initial assessment tool to support placing the right learner on the right course. Our FET for Everyone approach involves integrating services as part of the learner journey. Successful collaboration across services and the sharing of best practice among staff teams as well as a highly skilled teaching staff, many of whom have joined us from industry, ensures that progression pathways are clear and relevant for learners. Crucial to our integrated approach is collaboration with other FET centres and services within LOETB. For us in Tullamore FET, it is extremely important for us to work with our colleagues in other FET centres, particularly those in the broader Tullamore FET campus, including CTC, NLN and Midland Skills Centre. We have an integrated view of FET in our programmes. For example, our engineering programmes use the facilities of Tullamore CTC in delivering the practical elements of the programme. Similarly, we work closely with our FET outreach coordinators in enabling outreach learners to sample modules at level 5. This helps to break down any fear barriers associated with progressing to another FET centre as outreach learners continue to have supports from their own FET centre while sampling a level 5 module here in Tullamore FET. 
This has made the transition much easier, allowing the learners to progress to a full-time level five program here and onto employment, apprenticeships or third level afterwards. Progression rates are high in Tullamore FET. Last year alone, over 80% of our learners progressed onto other FET courses, higher education or employment. Crucial to this success is the integrated approach we use in Tullamore FET, where learners can see clear pathways for progression. An essential component of this is the guidance service, which meets all learners in identifying a learning pathway in Tullamore FET. We also work closely with our training service colleagues, particularly in apprenticeship and services to employment, who assist in identifying possible employment opportunities for our learners. The addition of training services to the structure of ETBs has allowed us to engage with local employers and to respond to local employment needs in the design and delivery of our programmes. For example, this academic year we will run a QQI Level 5 Construction Technology course in response to the skill shortage in the construction sector. In delivering this course, we will work closely with our FET colleagues in the National Construction Training Centre in Mount Lucas. We've also built excellent relationships with third level colleges, particularly AIT. In a number of our full-time Level 5 courses, our teachers work closely with AIT departments in delivering certain components of modules in AIT campus. Here we have the example of our Level 5 hotel and restaurant skills students in AIT. This as a result gives the learner huge exposure to third level college, thus removing any fears of progressing to third level education. We've had great success stories in the centre of students progressing through the levels and going on to third level education, employment or apprenticeships in the financial services. One of those success stories is Barry Williams, who will now talk to you about his own learning journey. So my name is Barry Williams and I want to tell you a little bit about my journey through further education with Lee Shoffley ETB, which began in 2014. After finding myself unemployed at 49, with little education or qualifications, I decided to look into a further education course with ETB in Tullamore. I enrolled to do a career skills level 4 course to try to enhance my employability. I enjoyed it so much that I made a decision with the advice from my tutor at the time and the guidance counsellors to go forward uh, to a level 5 PLC course in computer systems and networks as computers were a particular interest to me. Having completed this course in 2016 with results that surprised me, I once again took the advice of tutors and guidance counsellors and applied for a level 6 two year higher certificate course in electronics and computer engineering at Athlone Institute of Technology. I found the whole college experience was amazing and at the end of two years I decided um, that I would add a year and complete a level 7 ordinary degree in computer engineering. By that time I was seriously considering uh, what I would do when I finished college. I was very passionate about imparting my knowledge to others and felt teaching further education was the road I should, I should take. With that in mind, I again added a year and completed a level eight honours degree in software engineering. Due to the restrictions last year, I put my journey on hold and spent my time doing a part-time train the trainer course with the Galway uh, Institute of Technology and also mentored some students for ETB here in Tullamore. I have kept in close contact with ETB in Tullamore and have found them always ready to advise or help in any way that they can. This year I have been accepted to Minute University for a level 8 higher diploma in further education which will commence in September and the ETB have very kindly accepted me for work placement during my course. None of this would have been possible without the dedicated tutors and staff, too numerous to mention at Lee Shoffley ETB, who had faith in me and encouraged me to be the best that I could be. I think I have justified that faith, and while I have this opportunity, I want to thank them all from the bottom of my heart for all their support over the past few years. Thank you very for that and we wish you the very best of luck in your future studies. To conclude, 
For Tullamore FET, clear communication, good relationships across FET services, local employment knowledge and a learner focus allows our integrated FET centre to provide access, transfer and progression pathways for all. The new National FET strategy talks about the FET College of the future. At LOETB we are providing the FET centre of the future now. Thank you very much.